In previous videos, I discussed the various physical characteristics of EM radiation. Now, you may have been taught that we can only see the intensity of EM radiation as brightness and, to some extent, its frequency as colors. This, of course, is wrong. Or at least it's an oversimplification. In fact, the characteristics of EM radiation that we can detect with the unaided eye through visual perception are shown in this list, and in this video I'll briefly discuss each one. We cannot see the amplitude fluctuations of the electric or magnetic field strengths directly. However, the more extreme are the amplitude fluctuations of a wavefront of EM radiation, the more energy can be transferred by that part of the wavefront to some other object, such as the rod and cone photoreceptor cells of our retina, or the sensor pixels of a camera chip. This measure of energy transfer is called the intensity of the EM radiation and it is modelled mathematically by what is called the time-averaged pointing vector, which is related to the amplitude squared of the electric field component of the EM radiation, integrated over a period of time in a unit area of space. That is why, in this animation, you see high-intensity areas developing where the wave undulates the most, like here, and low-intensity areas developing where the wave undulates the least, as in these zones here. So, intensity is a measure of energy transferred by some point on the wavefront and depends on the amount of time you integrate or average over as well as the amplitude squared. However, we don't see intensity directly. What we actually perceive is brightness. So, how is brightness related to energy intensity? Well, there's a lot of neurophysiological and perceptual processing that goes on between the membrane polarization change signals generated by the retinal photoreceptor cells in response to the intensity of the EM radiation falling on them, and what we end up thinking we see. I can't go over all the detail here, but I'll give just a few of the important highlights that we know about. The membrane potential of the primary photoreceptor cells, the rods and cones, respond to intensity of EM radiation via a logarithmic response curve. This basic signal does not go to the optic nerve directly, but passes to the retinal ganglion cells via a network of intermediate cells, which include the bipolar, horizontal and amacrine cells, which effectively integrate the rod and cone signals from a small patch of retina called a receptive field onto the dendrites of a single ganglion cell and the action potential spike signals from the axon of this ganglion cell are then conducted down the optic nerve in a frequency modulated system of pulses. The various receptive fields do not tile the retina, rather they overlap one another to cover the retina. Each receptive field has a central and peripheral area such that the response to the intensity signal received in the central area is selectively modified by the intensity signal received in the peripheral area. This system enhances the detection of local contrast and functionally acts like a Laplacian convolution filter for the image. I'll discuss the process of convolutions and Fourier transforms in another video, but in the meantime here are some examples of Laplacian convolutions performed on digital images to give you an idea of how they modify the signal to enhance transitional contrast. But we don't actually see the world like this, do we? So this tells you that this initial processing is further complicated by many more steps. For example, there is a variable gain of the visual system as a whole depending on ambient light levels, the so-called dark adaptation response, which also changes the relative functional size of the central and peripheral zones in the receptive fields. So these fields are not functionally static. After these highly processed signals leave the eye via the optic nerve, they are further tempered by various image context relative perceptual effects further up the visual system. All this adds up to the fact that EM radiation of exactly the same intensity can be perceived as being of different brightness depending on the image context, a phenomenon known as simultaneous brightness contrast. And this is a basis for many optical illusions, such as the Hermann or scintillating grid, which makes you think you see dark spots in the light areas between the squares. And the Adelson illusion, where two areas emitting exactly the same EM radiation intensity appear to be of significantly different brightness due to the context of their surroundings.
Furthermore, perceived brightness depends on the concentration and proportions of retinal receptor cells, which differs across the visual field, and also on the wavelength of the incoming EM radiation. Yes, that's right. Wavelength influences brightness too, not just color. This is partly because our rod cells, which are the most abundant photoreceptor over all the retina and are responsible for our monochromatic and low light level vision, are most sensitive to EM radiation with wavelengths around the 498 nanometer range, which corresponds to what we would perceive as green light with our cone cells. So, even though energy intensity of EM radiation itself is independent of wavelength, we perceive a green light as being brighter than a blue or a red light, when all three sources shine with equal physical intensity. There are also different subtypes of retinal ganglion cells, at least one of which has a very wide and relatively uniform receptive field, not modified with differential central and peripheral zones, and these are thought to mediate signals related to overall intensity, like the zero-order coefficients in a Fourier transform, rather than image contrast. Now, there is an enormous literature on all of this, and I've only scratched the surface with this very simplified summary that doesn't even begin to go near the effects of motion on visual perception. So let's just say that perceived brightness of an EM field is related to its intensity, but in a way that defies any simple or fixed response curve. Most people will be familiar with the fact that color vision depends on our ability to discriminate between EM radiation with different frequencies. The tri-stimulus theory of color vision, that the perception of any color can be created from an appropriate mixture of three primary colors, was put forward in the 1800s by Thomas Young and Hermann von Helmholtz, and is called the Young-Helmholtz theory. This is due to the fact that we have retinal receptor cells called cones that come in three types. Each type of cone cell reacts with maximal efficiency in response to stimulation by EM radiation of different frequency ranges, these ranges being centered on wavelengths that correspond to what we perceive as the colors red, green, and blue. There are genetic variations in how our retinal receptor cells respond to different frequency EM radiation, so different people can perceive the same frequency range of EM radiation as different colors to other people. Forms of so-called color blindness are due to the lack or relative functional lack of one or more types of these cone cells and or higher color processing functions in the brain. Most colorblind people have both eyes affected, but rarely only one eye is affected. These rare individuals are therefore able to give non-colorblind people a comparative subjective description of what it is like to see with the type of color blindness they have. However, just as with brightness, there's a lot more to perceiving color than a simple equation mixing three primaries into a definite color. For example, saturated pure colors appear brighter than unsaturated colors in cases where both are presented using EM radiation of the same overall intensity. This is known as the helmholtz kohlrausch effect. The betzold brucker hue shift is a kind of inverse of this, where the essential hue or color of EM radiation of a single frequency range is perceived to change, depending on changes in its intensity only. Now, I'm about to show you some flashing images for the next 40 to 45 seconds, so if you're sensitive to that, you should look away now, until you hear me start to talk about chromatic adaptation effects. Differing concentrations of the various types of cone cells and retinal pigments can also give rise to entoptic alterations in color perception. An example of this is the dark Maxwell's spot, which can be noticed by about 80% of people. In 1856, James Clark Maxwell published an observation that he noticed a dark spot when he looked at the blue region of a spectrum produced by a prism. The spot moved with his eyes and disappeared when he looked at any of the other colors. He postulated that this could be related to the preferential absorbance of blue wavelengths by the yellow pigment of the macula. We now know that this is also partly mediated by a relative lack of the blue receptive cones in the fovea. Okay, the flashing images have ended. Another color perception altering phenomenon are chromatic adaptation effects. These make us perceive EM radiation of the same wavelength profile and intensity as different colors depending on the color context in which that stimulus is experienced, a phenomenon sometimes referred to as color relativity or the Betzold effect. And various optical illusions can result from this, such as the Munker illusion and a recent extension of that called the Confetti illusion, described by David Novick and Akiyoshi Kitaoka in the Journal of Illusion. In this illusion, 
balls of the same colour appear to us as being of different colours when they are partly overlaid with different coloured stripes. There is also a temporal context to perception of both colours and brightness, in that we tend to only perceive things that change over time. This is why, for example, you don't normally see the blood vessels that are constantly on top of your retina, although they can be made visible under certain circumstances using oblique illumination. This is also one reason why our eyes undergo continual motions called saccades and micro saccades, in order to keep the retinal image changing. If there is no change in the image falling on the retina for long enough, then we essentially go blind to that image. Saccadic motions have other functions too, but I won't go into those here. A good example of temporal context perception are the illusions based on the Troxler fading effect, such as the lilac chaser illusion shown here. In this case, by staring at the central black cross and trying to keep your eyes as still as possible, eventually you go blind to the magenta discs and only perceive a green flash when each magenta disc briefly disappears. The green appearance is a result of your eyes having been adapted to the level of red and blue colours that make up the magenta spot, so your blue and red sensitivity is reduced in that area. Thus, when the magenta spot vanishes, only your green sensors are still working at high sensitivity, so the lack of magenta, to which you have gone insensitive, to the point of temporary blindness, appears as being actively green. This is despite the fact that there is no excess of EM radiation emitted from that point with a frequency otherwise associated with the green colour sensation. The neural adaptation mechanisms underlying this effect are not restricted to the retina, but involve processes taking place in the central nervous system. If you want to learn more about this, then read up on something called the opponent process theory of colour vision. Finally, some of you may be wondering why people speak of infrared light or ultraviolet light, if by definition these wavelengths are invisible to us. Well, the reason for this is that while we can't see in these ranges under usual circumstances, it is possible in some situations. For example, low energy infrared photons can be detected by two photon excitation if the source of EM radiation is intense enough. This is where simultaneous absorption of two infrared photons provides enough energy similar to a single visible range photon to stimulate the photoreceptors. Furthermore, the eye lens absorbs UV, so people with aphakia can see further into the UV range than others. Also, some rare people have a genetic alteration that allows them to see into the ultraviolet, such as those with a fourth type of cone cell sensitive in that region. Such people are said to have tetrachromacy, but this is thought to be very rare. In addition, other members of Kingdom Animalia, which have sight, can respond to visual signals in the infrared and UV wavelengths, so for them these EM ranges are forms of light, examples being bees and other insects that can see ultraviolet light on petals, which guide them to the nectaries in flowers, as well as many vertebrates including some birds. Therefore, just as the perception of brightness is complexly related to intensity of EM radiation, so also colour is complexly related to wavelength rather than having some simple one-to-one -one mapping. Everything I've been saying up to this point emphasises that EM radiation itself has no intrinsic colour or brightness. Colour and brightness, which define the thing we call light, are purely perception phenomena. Now we move into less widely known territory. Visual effects due to both linear and circular polarization states of incoming EM radiation can be seen as faint patterns of colour in certain circumstances, and these patterns change their orientation with the orientation of the polarization axis of the EM radiation. Thus, many people can see the polarization of incoming polarized EM radiation, but this effect is only noticeable in certain circumstances. As with other visual phenomena, adaptation occurs to a static polarization state, so this effect is more noticeable if the predominant plane of polarization is gradually constantly rotating. This ability to see polarization is due to two physical attributes of our eyes. The first is that the cornea has parallel arrangements of collagen fibers which alternate in various layers as to the angle of their parallel arrangements. This gives rise to a natural form of birefringence of the cornea. The second is the presence of dichroic carotenoid pigments in the macula with a maximum absorbance frequency of around 458 nanometers. Together, these can mediate the perception of faint patterns of color, the orientation of which depend on the polarization state of the incoming EM radiation. 
These patterns are called Heidinger's brushes, named after Wilhelm Karl Ritter von Heidinger, who described these effects in 1844. For those interested in learning more about this, I recommend reading this paper from Bristol, published in 2015. We can detect if EM radiation entering our eyes has a high degree of spatial coherence due to the production of interference patterns from phase contrast effects. This happens if the medium which the EM radiation travels through on its way to our retina has localized regions of different refractive index. Examples of this may be variations in the thickness of the tear layer covering our cornea, any imperfections in the crystalline structure of our ocular lens, and any floaters in or behind our vitreous humor. All these things become visible or more exaggerated if the EM radiation passing through them en route to our retina produces relatively undiluted interference patterns, that is, EM radiation with a high degree of spatial coherence. This is also true of images viewed or captured via a microscope. Specks of dust or imperfections in the lenses or other optics and phase differences in any specimen become more visible when illuminated with light with a high degree of spatial coherence. Sometimes deliberately making the illumination more coherent in a microscope to get these enhanced phase contrast effects can be useful, but at other times we want to avoid this because it can cause distracting visual features such as the enhancement of floaters in our eyes or highly visible lens dust specks. I'll say more about controlling the coherence of illumination in microscopy in another video. We detect the shape of the wavefront of incoming EM radiation fields thanks to the refraction and interference patterns produced by our cornea and the ocular lens. The resulting interference pattern that falls on our retina varies in resultant amplitude and therefore in perceived brightness according to the shape of the incoming wavefront. This pattern is more commonly known as the image that we see. As I discussed in video 3 of this series, the shape of a wavefront encodes image information. A focusing lens system is one way of recovering or decoding that wavefront data back into an image. There are other ways of decoding wavefront shape information, such as using a Schack-Hartmann wavefront sensor, but this essentially boils down to an array of little lenses, called lenslets, that detect the local shape of the wavefront at each point in the array in a similar manner to the way a larger lens amalgamates all that information into a single image. Light can be defined as a combination of brightness, color, and shape, all of which are visual perception phenomena. The light we perceive via our eyes is related to certain characteristics of the EM wave field received by our visual system, namely its amplitude, frequency, polarization state, degree of coherence, and the shape of the wavefront. I said it is related to those things, not directly proportional to them. The relationships between EM radiation features and perceived light are not direct, simple, linear, constant, or absolute, because visual perception is influenced strongly by many other factors. If you like this video, please hit the thumbs up like button and view some of the other videos on my channel. If you'd like to support the project, you can do that by subscribing to this channel and telling others about it. If you'd like to help me continue this work, take a look at my Patreon page, where you'll find additional content and early bird access to future videos. Thanks for watching.